Here we go. So, um, <laughs> um, hi, hi, everybody. Um, so the lecture's topic today is uh, endless cities, and I put the screen, the image that you see was uh, on screen was developed by the students of your university that I taught last year. Uh, and today we are going to talk about uh, urban scale first, uh, which is what you are probably doing uh, in your course, uh, in your next project. So we we'll look at a couple of projects at the urban scale, and then which is L, which is a large, and an XL scale. And then I'm going to talk about um, the second half of the lecture. I'm going to talk about XXL, which is mainly a city level scale because I think it's quite important when you are studying urban scale that you understand where that scale belongs to in the overall perspective of the cities. So in that scale, I'll talk a bit about the lectures. But um, just uh, starting from the first slide now. Um, so initially um, in the 19, uh, late 80s and early 90s, there was a lot of uh, diagrams uh, that were being done at Zardi Architects. Uh, in terms of the, uh, using the diagonal as, in, as a new medium and a language. So uh, that kind of breaks away from the traditional grid that, that we are used to seeing in the cities of the 60s, uh, which was more the Corbusian era. And, uh, but it's still very prevalent, the, the orthogonal grid. But the diagonal was kind of one, one transient or one kind of direction that, um, and, uh, that Zahari the architect started at the time. But moving on, when I came uh, to the London, uh, we were talking about parametric urbanism, and, and there was a lot of um, word going around, and, and, uh, but they were not being built at that time. So we were testing models of, of how digital versions could help us build uh, larger scale urban platforms, um, and which led to something like a book like this coming up, which said that, what planet are they on? So literally everyone was saying that this is crazy. Uh, so, um, but soon enough, we, 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 we went into Singapore, uh, Zahadi Architects did a, a version of the plan called One North Master Plan, which got implemented. Um, so moving on from there, things have matured a little bit. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about two projects. One is the large scale project, which is a competition that the office won, uh, Zahadi Architects won in Tallinn. It's a port city, it's more related to the, the version that you're gonna study in your, um, in your class. And uh, I'm just gonna briefly take you through uh, the kind of process we have done through this project. So um, if you don't know Tallinn, um, so this is an overall couple of pictures, I'll go through the views first. Um, it, it does get very cold. Uh, in that area, it's a port area, it's one of the primary ports, and they wanted to develop something between the port and the rest of the city. So it was like a transient uh, interface between the two. So as you can see, the rest of the city is behind and the port is in front. So the port used to be a very tiny port, but it got popular over the years. And uh, once its popularity grained, they thought they could make a multifunctional. So uh, to give you a location on the maps, that's Tallinn. Um, which is right opposite Helsinki, and you have Turku. So it comes on the major kind of a cruise route, as well as it comes into the Viking line. And so there are two, three ferry lines that kind of meet, and, and, and they kind of meet together in, in Tallinn. So um, these are um, some other major cruise routes. Um, so to, to give you an uh, overall hint, this is the current state of the site. So the state of the site, there's nothing on there. It's just ports and a lot of... Um, subsidiaries uh, for that port activity. And, and this is the overall situation of the main master plan of the city where old towns are and the new, and, and then there is the harbor in the blue, that's where the port is. And the airport is on the bottom right corner. So in, in every city, you would find diagrams like these, which are like land use diagrams on the left, which, um, Sometimes they're very true, but sometimes they're not because they don't give you the level hierarchies because sometimes lower levels are commercial and upper levels are residential. But on an overall scale, you can see that there's a lot of hotels, there's a lot of residential. And as you come closer, there are these green spaces which are in particular chunks. Uh, but in that port area, there is nothing. It's, it's quite clean. 
Um, so we came, uh, the office came out with the concept of the stream city. So basically the idea was that you have the spine that behaves like a stream. And from that stream, you create these arteries and, and you have, and wherever these arteries branch, you create the hubs or the attractors. It's a very simple concept. It's a, it's a stream um, uh, which branches out and every time it branches, you got the hubs. So moving on from there, uh, you get to a site plan uh, that kind of subdivides, helps you subdivide the modules, uh, the block sizes, et cetera, and kind of links to the existing site road connections. So in funk programmatic kind of way, it's very simple. You've got the cruise terminals on the top, the north and the south, and uh, and down below is, is uh, entrepreneurs and basically a kind of a new drivers that would change the sport area into a successful business model. Uh, that's the main key. Um, so we had four phases and, and they are to be done by, you know, city waterfront by 18. Uh, it was planned, but it's not there yet. It then 21, 25 and 30. So by 2030, they would have this entire master plan done uh, of, the, of this area. So these are some of the program distributions um, in terms of residential housing, but you can see uh, there's a ground level distribution and an upper level distribution. So we start fragmenting what we traditionally see as city uh, land use. That land use now depends a lot on the floors uh, that, you, that you use. And on top of the land use, this is the, this is the diagram of the levels. So this is a low rise, um, high density model of urbanism. Um, it's very important. There are two kinds of urbanisms mostly in picture. There's low rise, high density, and there is high rise, high density. And the next project we will see is high rise, high density. And, and we'll talk about the consequences and then we'll move to the third, which is the largest city model. Um, so this is a low rise, high density model. You've got four to five stories on combined together, residential, commercial. So it's a mixed use. Um, a very different um, uh, overall massing that you would see otherwise in, in most urban developments. Um, so uh, this is also, we had to do what we call as a cost consultant who came in and figured out how the crash flow and the profitabilities of these things would work out. And, and on top of that, we had um, uh, you know, connectivity diagrams of how, how the existing roads are there, what is gonna be the new circulation. So you can see when on the bottom right, uh, we've got the pedestrian and cycle routes. On the, on the top left, you've got the existing road network and then the public transport systems, how they work on the bottom left. So it's, it's a lot of layers of circulation, mainly based on the speed of your transport. So next going on to the ferry circulation because it was a very important ferry terminal. So you see the ferry lines of where you go in, where you go out, the truck circulation for the ferries, uh, the cruise route, the pedestrian routes, the service access. So basic idea is to pick up the, the existing center, existing roads that you have, and then kind of try and navigate it through the site and keep as much as possible the minimum distance for these, uh, especially for the, uh, the trucks and the cars, so they don't interfere too much with the pedestrian circulation. So this is the overall street network on the surface uh, and how you can go around uh, the primary road, the secondary road, and, and where are the car accesses. So in this case, the cars go penetrate right through the site. Uh, so you can see there's parking all over the place. Um, and, and sorry, and then just a bit more about the road sections that you, know, you, you can see on the top uh, bottom center that you have a section where the cars and the lorries are below and the pedestrian come and cover it on top. So it kind of, uh, even though the cars are entering very much penetrating the site because it needs to reach the ferry terminus, but you do not see them on, on ground, which is uh, kind of being for most urban design planning concepts uh, in contemporary um, and that's what they ask you that reduce the cars on the road. Um, so these are uh, some more um, traffic forecasts. So you've got to predict the forecast of how much traffic is going to come in, how much traffic is going to move out based on the con existing. But I mean, these are very uh, preliminary studies. Usually what we have noticed is that whenever you plan a traffic 
uh, it always goes the other way around. It, it kind of <laughs> exceeds its limitations. But um, we got a lot of consultants to work on it. And, and, and I think one of the ideas was to that because there's going to be traffic below the ground, you try and maintain more green spaces and activate the spines above the ground with more activity. And, um, and, and then you come into the summer activities and winter activities because it snows a lot uh, in that area. And then you cluster the food activities, etc., all around it. So um, obviously landscape, uh, the vegetations, uh, what are the important vegetation features? Um, I think someone's on <laughs> microphone. Um, so, um, so you kind of put, uh, uh, try and make it as much as possible uh, more green on, on the surface. Um, so, it, so it kind of maintains a greenery in the summers as well as in the winters. So the pruners uh, would, would be active in the winters and it still has a nice uh, feature. So the, so the landscape is also a very weather oriented landscape in, in such a harsh climate. So um, I'm not gonna go through too much about the sustainability aspects. It's about integration, et cetera. But uh, moving on, um, you, this is a user diagram on how the user will walk through the surface, the ferry passenger, and even in the pedestrians, there are categories of the ferries, the ferry passengers, the local passengers, and, and so on. So, so where you, you can come in if you're using certain um, functions on the site. This is the cross section that, and as I was saying, it's five, six stories. You can see the massing, it's very low rise, it's high density, but at the same time, it also talks about different levels and, uh, and some of the landscape uh, images here. Um, so this is a spine that connects the two sides. Uh, so we propose a bridge uh, that takes you across, which is a pedestrian bridge. And, and these are some of the typical uh, modules uh, of the housing. So, it, it's still a linear block, but with centralized core. And, and, and then you have, um, you know, the, sorry, this was the office uh, residential neighborhood. And then you have uh, the views of the residential and, and it's just the office typology. So the typologies are very similar and they kind of, uh, and, and they have all the similar system of uh, centralized corridors and, and cores and, and views uh, because it's close to the sea, so all the functions, uh, residential or offices, have views on the outside. Um, so this is what it looks like, um, and then we have the typical um, commercial complex as well, which looks very similar. And then you can see you you have outdoor seating and outdoor spaces with lights and trees. These are some more images of the massing. There was <laughs> talks about a cable car as well. So uh, let's see if that comes through. Uh, but, um, but, and this is the ferry terminal. And uh, this is one of the iconic. Um, so you see that every time you have an urban system, you try and achieve a couple of iconic concepts. And, and this something is we're gonna talk about later in the lecture as well, the, the importance of iconicity in, in, in a master plan. And so this is one icon and the other icon is, um, uh, which is the landmark tower at the other end which is symbolizing some kind of a lighthouse, but it's not exactly functionally a lighthouse. Moving on to the next project. Uh, this is what I call the XL model, which is very high density, um, high rise, high density in an urban scenario. And this, this one happens to be in Hangzhou, which is in China. Uh, we, are, we won the competition. Um, a big team is working on this at the moment. Hello. Can you please mute? Okay, so, um, so uh, this is the high rise, high density model. And in the high rise, high density model, um, we, we have two, two again, a similar situation. I chose this side because it's, it's very much um, towards what you are studying this semester. So it's next to the waterfront, uh, two, two massing blocks on either side, and we tried to create a connectivity bridge. And, and this is called the seam let city. Uh, and, and these are some of the predecessors of this uh, is, is the Valley project and there are a couple of other projects in Shenzhen and Beijing district that we had proposed previously, which are all high rise, high density models. Um, so typically you, you, have the, you have got the river in front 
and from that river they, we have these uh, so the initial study of us the leading commerce domain across the site and how they connect to these new new this new um, land and the second was the environmental domain that what are the closest environmental attractors and the cultural so economic environmental cultural and social domains what are the social activities next so these were the initial studies uh, that that led us to um, to try and find a model of massing that would be successful uh, and um, in this particular area so um, a lot of it was done by scripting so you now you start seeing a bit more um, uh, computation coming into the massing uh, how do you generate it what should be the sight lines and mostly it was driven by the sight lines from building to building so they don't obstruct each other completely because in a high rise high density model uh, if you look at liverpool street for example you know you've got the gherkin but you can't see the gherkin anymore because there's a massive um, 30 story tall tower in front of it now uh, so which used to be an icon of london is now completely engulfed in the city fabric of the high rise towers so you've lost the lost the icon which you had once planned so to, to maintain that, you, we try to do a, like a visual connectivity diagram that you would see um, to how to maintain. So this was the, the overall master plan, but this is the connectivity that how they kind of visually connect to each other, all the tall towers, and, and try and not obstruct each other. Um, the idea of the seam uh, city came from a traditional silk reef, but um, the, it was mostly about connecting the two islands uh, on the other side, not islands, but the two clusters and massing. And, and we tried to do an iconic bridge uh, that, would, that would bridge across this uh, city. So these are some of the mobility diagrams. Again, uh, so you've got the slow mobility, again, the river mobility, um, and, and the pedestrian uh, connectivity on the west and the east bank and how they kind of move across the bridge. So um, at, uh, with this, there was also the icon of the Ferris wheel, uh, which you can see in the front. So that was another supposed to be the, the attraction or, or the icon along with the bridge that would uh, make this development a noticeable one. So when you're work coming in from the river, you notice the bridge and you notice the icon and then the massing is on the side. So this br brings us to uh, a master plan uh, that looks like this, which has got obviously again a similar strategy that you have a lot of green and urban scape on the top and, and, and then the massing um, in between it. Um, going, going to the de deployment, but you can see here the social and co-working is in one sector and then the commercial and residential move to the back end of the site. So making the social hubs coming close to the bridge. So the activity zones are more focused into this uh, little bay that, 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 that creek that comes into the site. Um, these are some of the mobility, again, some more mobility diagrams of how it works, but I'm not gonna go into much detail, but moving on to the pedestrian bridge, which was the icon, icon of, the, of the area, you, you see um, it kind of cross crosses and then goes back on itself. Um, and uh, that's the elevation of the bridge and moving on. Um, okay, so then you get into a much more detailed functions of the marina. You see the yacht, yacht clubs and you've got the marina. Then you have a little bit of, uh, you know, tea mountain and etc. So there's a lot of, um, let's say, amenity features all along this promenade here and all along that promenade here. And, and the residential neighborhoods then tend to have their own little clusters of, of amenities within them. Um, so these are the schematic layouts. Uh, I'm not gonna talk into much detail on the layouts, but again, the same idea of, of functions changing at different levels to get the mix used. And these are the program brief uh, and uh, so the next icon was the Ferris wheel and uh, we did a lot of options for the wheel. Uh, we, though ultimately, I think this one's going forward um, and, and this is what it looks like from the top. So coming to, so these are some of the projects that, that were more relevant to the scale that you are studying at the moment. Um, but I want you to, um, and I, this is a bit of my research that has been going on for a few years, I mean, over 10 years and, and 
finally we've come to a stage that we can start implementing or seeing some of the implementation and some of the competitions uh, and I'll show one of them. But this is a model of at a city level and it's very important to understand this uh, when or I feel it's very important because when you're doing local scales and local urban scenarios you forget the city level consequences and um, so uh, I call it the endless cities and this was in 2008 uh, when I was doing a research with Charles Correa at the time uh, and we realized that the world how you and Habitat came up with a report um, that uh, the cities are going to increase in population and 28 of mega cities will have more than 8 million and I think now it's even more. Uh, 10 million is, is minimum the, the urbanization has rapidly in increased. So, um, and it, it all started uh, very many years ago in the early 90s when Ibn Zer Howard was talking about the town and the advantages of the town, advantages of the country living. You know, the town has this attraction for people to come together to, to form energy bubbles that will create, have more creativity and more development where the country gives you more space and more freedom to relax and, 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 and have larger spaces for yourself. But the idea for him uh, to do the study was to propose what they call a town country. But the town country never, or what he was trying to get into as a garden city, but it never really got developed because um, it, what it took, what it became was the urbanization of the 1960s, which became a car-driven urbanization that, that completely changed the dynamics, which was the Corbusier model of uh, Zuli Carbuzio when he was planning uh, Chanigar and, and, and then at the same time Brasilia was being planned. It was a car driven model. So the town country never came in, but the town became the city, which was a completely high, high, high density model. So what we have here is a, is a LSE, London School of Economics graph that shows you that most cities in the world are highly dense in certain areas where the jobs are and not so dense. So that even within a city, which is a large, large landmass, you may have 10 million people or 15 million people, but the density of density, which is the key item of the city, is not distributed evenly. Only one of the cities that you see that is distributed pretty even or used to be was London. And, and, um, and there was a reason for it because London was not planned in the 60s, 1960s. It wasn't really much planned. We'll study that as well. But first, we will see that why cities are the way they are in the 21st century, which was the 1900s. You know, you're talking about the largest cities that were ever designed uh, was Chandigarh, Navi Mumbai, Brasilia, and, and can, recently there's one in Saudi Arabia done by SOM. And, and, and the problem with these cities were that, you know, you, you have the grid system which is then molded uh, into this kind of shapes and sizes and adapted. And, and you continue the grid that extended, uh, well, initially, as, as you know, that the, the Kribuzian model was for, Chandigarh was for 6 lakh people, which is like uh, 60,000 people and, and um, 600,000. So 600,000 to 10 million is a big, very big difference. But what we have planned to do in the contemporary years is take that 600,000 model and we kind of multiplied it, which doesn't really work. Um, so, uh, so these were the benchmark and how do you design over 10 million people. So uh, we looked at what was the traditional city model. So the, there was obviously this Howard City Beautiful scheme. So where you have the promenade, which, uh, which you see in Lachin's Delhi or uh, parts, of, uh, parts of Paris, not all of Paris. Uh, but Paris is also a very high, low rise, high density model. And, and it has a lot of, um, it has a really high density. It's 21,000 people per square kilometer, which is, which is quite high compared to any other city in the world, but it still has a complete low rise fabric. Um, and then there was the linear city, which grew out of the net, uh, railway networks and, and, and all primary road networks for Brasilia, even though it's a grid city, but it, it, it follows a very linear system. And then you had New York, which was where the railways came in and people settled along it and Bombay, for example. And the third, which was the most oldest version, is the grid. It's, it's, it's the orthogonal grid. When I say the grid, I mean the orthogonal grid, which, which was in Mohenjo-Daro, which was like you know, 4,000 BC, to Chandigarh uh, or Mexico City, which is the largest grid city in the world, which can achieve densities of 6,000 per square kilometer. So um, what was the problem with the orthogonal grid? The orthogonal grid had a problem with its connectivity because you can't connect all the systems together. 
But where on the other side, the, the rail system or the model proposed in Navi Mumbai had a different kind of problem was the density problem. Because every time you know where you're gonna put the main sources or the main nodes, the developers come in first and the densities get higher and immediately the city gets uneven distribution. So what does this do? Uh, when you plan new cities currently, you have really high investments from the government. You need very heavy initial infrastructure and you need a strong authoritative direction to build these kind of cities of the 60s which was possible at the time, but now it's no longer possible. Because what, so what happened now, what happens now is that you have, they took a, uh, currently you have the system which was a complex city theory and, and it has this collective behavior game theory, everything inside it. So currently the model is to have heavy investments into certain areas of the city and, and generate the economy. The city behaves as an engine for the economy. Uh, so, but it doesn't talk about the people of the city. And that is why we see so much of high rise towers uh, in the city. So this is the result of what London is supposed to look like uh, and what I call as Primark urbanism. It's me, it's prime. I mean, if you guys have been to Primark, it's very simple. Their philosophy is like you buy a cloth, you, you you wear it for two weeks or two months and it fades out you you throw it away and you buy a new one and that keeps the economy in motion and that is the same thing that cities are working on it's primark urbanism you, you're building new centers you're building buildings and you no one's living in there um it becomes some model of a ghost town in certain areas the offices lie empty because it's too expensive the residences lie empty because it's too expensive but it doesn't matter it provides job for the people and we keep going. So this is the result of the cities that we see today. And, and, and that was the result um, uh, 10 years ago when I was visiting China, the, the, the ghost towns, because the average Chinese income at that time was $70,000 to $100,000. Uh, but, 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 sorry, that 70,000 to 100,000 was the property value and $6,000 was the income. So amount of time it would take to get, get buy a house was impossible. So that's why, and, and at the same time, we had the other problem of the cars, which was building in this kind of, uh, you know, smog, et cetera. And, and that's the primarily driven by the 60s model of the car urbanization. So we look back at distribution densities in cities like London, uh, which grew a bit organically. Uh, the initial town of London was the Roman town right in the center, which was only one square mile, which was a planned area. The rest of the areas, uh, what happened was the Anglo-Saxon towns grew up and these names are still there today. So it became a polycentric growth rather than a centric growth. And, and these Anglo-Saxon towns, uh, the names that you can still see today, grew over a period of time and the main connectivity of the roads, the major arteries ran through, but the overall, the secondary arte arteries is what makes a very complex system in London that is a mesh system. It is not linear, it is not branching. Um, so which creates the equal distribution of density because you do not know which one is the main artery apart from the major road. So you come across a city that's quite evenly distributed. But this was organic growth, remember. And, and, and what is the interesting thing to see here is that the minor road density, which is in black, is way higher than the major road density which is very unlike what you see in contemporary cities. In contemporary cities, the major road densities are higher than the minor road densities, which was the 60s model of planning. So we were doing a research. I, I started this research um, with Charles in uh, Korea initially in, in 2006, and we kind of moved forward. I came to London and we, there was a lot of computation coming in. So you had the L system, which is, the, which is on the left, which is the branching system where the main road is thicker than the rest. And you had on the right hand side another model, which is a biological model, which is the DLA. So DLA is a time based model. And, and, and this is what you see in, in corals, uh, coral reefs, not in an individual coral, but a reef. So the, what I'm trying to say is there's a difference between a tree and a forest. Urbanism is like a forest. Master plan cities are like a forest. It is not a tree. But we are used to seeing trees, so we try and design cities like trees, and that's how the 60s model came up. 
Um, so moving on, um, what are the advantages of, of a mesh system, which is, uh, which is what we are arguing, is that you always get icons in the center of the road, which gives you identity of a city, a character of the city. Whereas on the right hand side is New York, where it's a grid, a traditional orthogonal grid. You don't, every street looks the same because you don't hit any icon. So it loses character. Second thing is when you have a road network hierarchy, you have, you know, you've got the smaller roads on the end, you've got the major roads on the main. So every time you add any more density on the small road, you need to widen the main roads, which means that the main road ha has to go endlessly. Whereas in the mesh network, every time you create a new node, you actually create another way to go around it. So you, you add another node, you can go another way around the city. So um, on top of that, uh, the, the, if you see certain cities uh, and you plot them in relation to transport and land use versus the petroleum consumption, you would see that some of the European cities fall on the lower category because they are mostly mesh oriented cities, mesh layouts. And on the other end, the Houston, for example, uh, Los Angeles, they are very orthogonal grid uh, road hierarchy based. So they consume tremendous amount of transport and petroleum, et cetera, which gives you a result of the, of the smog. Um, this is a very interesting experiment by Fry Auto. Uh, it shows that when you connect all the nodes and you connect every node, the most optimized network is not a straight line. So right hand side is an optimization of all the connections and you see how they become start to feel more organic. Okay, this was a soap bubble experiment, but if, or wolf with wolf thread. But if, if you go deeper down into, into human bones, human blood cells, you see the networks are never hierarchical. hierarchical. They, are, they are complex systems, they're they mesh oriented, and, and they are the most efficient. So we look for, is there an alternative? Um, so, so most cities in the world today design as a benchmark. So we said that how does it work? So you know, fishes can 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 accumulate in huge numbers in a small, but they, they have this bottom-up system rule. And how do we get a bottom-up system for cities is what we were trying to rule that. So we came up with this uh, with this connectivity network of the DLA. And and I this was one of the experiments that was done. I, I'm not sure if this video would work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, Okay, the video is not working, but anyway, so, so we, we were playing around and this was done by some of the students in, in your uh, cluster last year. Uh, but, um, and, but we were working with a lot of computation and, and then we came to a point where we, took, where we take it forward and we try and plan the node instead of the road. So every time the city's density changes or certain node activity changes, you replan the node instead of widening the road, if it makes sense. So this was the principle of, of, our, of our system and, and obviously the distribution along the city. And you start seeing the images that you, that you, that you saw probably in, in, in bone structures. And, and it starts to build this efficient network of, of the systems. And then we looked at the scales, which were of the cluster scales, what is a walkable scale. So if you look at Chandigarh, it's way out of scale. But the most walkable cities like Manhattan are on the range of 200 meters uh, modules. So, and, and currently, if you've been following the news, you know that Paris has adopted the 15 minute city module, which is basically your work, your job, your study, everything is within 15 minutes walk or cycle. And, and that is the, the idea of making, uh, they, they've come up, uh, it's been argued for years by Jane Jacobs and, and, and many other people. And, you know, she wrote a book in the eighties. But it was never implemented because there was no, no, never a city plan that could do it. But Paris can do it because it, it was benefiting it from the original 50 um, mesh network system. And so is London transforming even today. You know, my road is closed and, and, and it's only for cycles only. And, and the car is being thrown out of the cities. And, and at the same time, we did a housing study as so a massing scale. So we, we think that we, if we accommodate taller buildings, we feel that we will be able to accommodate more people in a city, but it's not true. Because city 
is not just about buildings. It's also about giving people the amenities such as parks, giving people's amenities such as hospitals and, and schools, etc. So, so what you realize is that in a luxury unit, when we did this exercise, you realize that going over than five, 10, 10, 10 stories, it doesn't make sense because you don't give, save a lot in a city level as average area per person. But in a low income group unit, which is 25 square meters, you, you can, it doesn't make sense to go over five stories. So when you look at a city, so you basically averaged an entire city from five to 10 stories. So which means that unless, if all these housings that we are doing were filled up and all these high rise towers were filled up, unless we are not giving them the amenities, they have no space in the city. And this is why you see a lot of people moving out of the city when they make their money. And, and leave in the live live in the countryside is because they they feel that their their amenities are not being made, their schools are not being met, and they feel and most of the good schools, at least in the UK, you know, if you got talk about residential schools like Eton, Cheltenham, they're all away from the city. Uh, which also brings into some incremental growth model, models of housing that were being studied at the time by John Habrakan in Netherlands and, and and Korea, where you have diagonal connectivity, you can see through instead of linear roads where you know, safety becomes an issue, you have diagonal visual connectivity and you keep the car away. So we came up with this system of adaptive modules. So overall, what we are saying, we have the center, we have the time-based model, um, and, and you can grow in time. And as time grows, uh, little modules come up and amenities and retail spaces and, and so on and so forth. So this was very much as a conceptual stage till a certain point where we were planning this and we, we had this idea of polycentric growth. Till we, we went this year into a master plan which, was, uh, which gave us the opportunity to do this, which was a 152 square kilometer master plan in Li Shui, which is not very far from you guys. Um, and, and Li Shui is a place uh, which is uh, very famous for its river and landscape and, and, and they, they wanted something. So we got a, so just of yesterday, we got to know we got a creative award for this. But, um, but what we were planning, uh, the, the whole concept was focused on this idea of Shan Shui, which is the amalgamation or the bringing together of water, landscape and the mountains and people. And, and so, the, if you look at Li Shui, how it has grown over the period of time, Li Shui has grown in clusters um, in, in different areas. So you've got the, some, uh, the main city here, you've got an additional south city here, you've got little pockets of land being bought and developed in a 60s model uh, around the area. But the overall city is a connectivity of an entire river. So, um, and, and and bringing this together, we, we ran what we call a slime mold experiment to to find out where the new center should be. And, and that gave us the logic where it should be. So, um, so we made the new center, which is the Shan Shui Center. The center was empty and up, branching out from the centers were these little other centers. So we, we planted these little poly centers all around. And we, we said that the master plan itself is, is is, that's the overall site, as you can see. You can see a lot of empty spaces because there are mountains that you can't build there. But wherever we could build, uh, and you can see the traditional orthogonal grids, um, uh, you know, on the north, on the south, even inside our site, on the outside. So we try and make these connections through, and 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 we create these poly centers that that kind of come out from these uh, from the city, and obviously the major arteries we have the overall connectivity that brings out the major arteries of the site. But this is the deployment strategy. So you have the topography at the bottom, then you have the existing conditions, and then we took, then we, can, then we created what we call as urban spine or a green necklace, which uh, we were not the only one. There was uh, all other schemes that had done exactly the same thing. They created this urban spine with the green necklace. And then on top of that, we have the, we have the, the, the DLA system and the, and, the, and the major arteries of the DLA system. So when, when we deployed this, we did a space syntax analysis. So our partners uh, on this project were space syntax. They were, they're very famous in the UK for doing these spatial analysis. And, and it was very interesting that when we did the analysis, we put a traditional orthogonal grid that we could have done on the left-hand side. And we put a, um, 
our system on the right. And what it showed us that the, you know, the pink dots were the centers, the intensities in a traditional grid actually boils down to a certain areas. Whereas our system, their intensities uh, are fragmented. They're, they're, they're in multiple areas, which gives the, the road network junctions very different. You can see at the bottom that the, the different strategy, the five, five way connections, four way connections, three way connections, and so on. So uh, overall, the city principle was a 30 minute transportation uh, on, on high speed, uh, which would be either metro or a bus rapid transport. But even then, the road width would not exceed 24 meters. Uh, that was the principle. On the second hand, we had the multi-node transport system, um, which, which was car cycle, which was in the smaller roads and where the roads don't exceed 20 meters. Uh, and and the, finally the pedestrian and cycle and, and maybe household cars, which, which goes to 16 meters on the bottom, which you start seeing the complete mesh integration. So um, the green necklace, obviously I told you it's about some um, some amphitheaters and activating the public space, uh, and then you have you can see the residential distribution is kind of spread out uh, on the on these areas. So the city wouldn't grow from the centers; the city would grow from the poly centers, and the center is empty. So it was complete reverse of what we would do in an urban master plan today. And and then then comes the 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 retail and commercial developments, and and then from there. It, you get an integration of a mixed use within, instead of planning a mixed use, you ultimately result in a mixed use um, along the, because the retail and commercial always take the major roads, you see. But because the major roads penetrate through these cluster districts, so you, you have the residential deployment in the centers and it becomes a mixed use development over time. Our, whereas instead of planning in advance. So we, we had these three phases on which what the areas would be like, and, and these are some of the images. Um, but talking about the images and, 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 and also the 16 meter road in itself, it's not a permanent road. It has a flexible module. So you could change from a car to a tram to pedestrian and cycle only. So it all depends on how that area is developing what do we know if there is gentrification, which is a very common phenomenon, and no city planning plans for gentrification anymore. It, they, 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 they leave clusters, but they don't plan the roads, the flexibility module. And I think that's very critical as well. How do you get flexibility modules in gentrification? And then we have the building typologies. So you have, you know, a kind of like a Barcelona block typology to a solid block typology to a residential. But even in the residential, we wanted people to be investors as well. And so you could be a family, you can invest into a single plot. You could be a builder, you could buy a cluster and you could invest in it totally. Or you could be a block scale developer and you can invest in it. So there was idea of gaining the economy, not just through the top, 7% of the world's uh, riches, but also opening up the economy to, to the smaller people to, uh, to, to have their lifetime investment invested in a freehold land and, and move forward. Uh, on top of that, we, we also had the uh, strategy for uh, the, what you call the style guidelines on what colors the city, city should be. And, and, and so we restricted uh, the use of materials. Uh, so you could use any material, but the colors were restricted. And, and, and then the pedestrian form. form. Um, of course, we needed icons of transformation. So we, we create some, some icons in the city. One was the museum, uh, one was the shopping area. Um, one, this was uh, a gardens uh, in, in, in the wetland tourism area, uh, a resort in the mountains, uh, a Silicon Valley, uh, and, and, and what do we get in the end? I mean, this is a very important slide because what we get in the end is we are comparing all cities in the world with Li Shui. And, and what is quite important is that if you take one square kilometer cluster, which is what the scale you would be working on in, in, in your, probably in your project, you see the densities, um, uh, you see the road densities. You know, you look at London, you get, you know, 0.39. You look at Beijing, the road density is less, but the cluster size is so big, the, the, the block size is so big that you can't walk. You go to a walkable city like New York and you see the, the density has increased to 43%. And if you go way down, you look at Li Shui, 
which we planned is at 31%. So 31% and 39%, which is London, is pretty much close together. And we have been able to, um, we've kind of worked to simulate this at, at that level. Well, finishing it up, um, we, these are all the cities in the world. Uh, they are all in points, and you can see the, the land of the world is pretty much occupied. Um, if I take cities of 1 million population over, and this was done in 2014, if I take cities with 1 million population over, I try and connect it with high-speed rail, which is probably the fastest mode of tra um, transportation. This is what it looks like. This is only for cities with 1 million population. This is the rail systems that have already been proposed um, uh, in China, in, in, in the US, uh, in Europe. And you can already see a very dense connected mesh network of rail systems, which is very good. And I, I think hopefully this will all be implemented. But obviously we will still have some air flight transport as well. So, I mean, I was arguing more about high-speed rail that we should have a high-speed rail connectivity throughout the world. We shouldn't be able to, be, I mean, if you have to go shorter distances, but at the same time, we need some air transport or faster modes of transport. But Finishing off with a slide with Einstein, he said that the idea that computation and mind goes together, it's not either or. And, and you know, computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid, and human beings are incredibly inaccurate and brilliant. But together, they form a very powerful imagination. Um, this is one of the books of mine that will be coming out soon, hopefully. And if you, if you want to find me, um, follow or, you know, send a message of any questions, um, you can, you can, you can find me there. Great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, and if you haven't fallen asleep, you see, you see in a traditional lecture, I could see if you're falling asleep, <laughs> but now I can't. But um, if, you, if you have any questions uh, from the students there, I, um, okay. please. Stop sharing the screen so we can see you and the others on full screen mode. Uh, okay. And as you can see, they are still pretty awake. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question, but first couple of comments. One, uh, one is that you absolutely need a WeChat account, so you cannot produce only Instagram, Twitter, and um, Facebook, you guys. So I have a WeChat, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, work on, a, on an official WeChat account. And, All right. <laughs> uh, and before my question, I just want to highlight, especially to the Master Yard 2, about what we have been discussing also today. All the projects that Subak has been showing you are driven by either economy, which is a factor, of course, or uh, distances, or time or the concept of growth that he has been discussing, um, producing examples coming from a coral reef and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's, it's not more, it's not anymore at least, just taking blocks and putting blocks one after another. And also please pay attention to the fact that all the discussion was on three dimensions, so not just X and Y, so not just a master plan, but also discussing what's going on on, uh, on um, different levels of the city. And going to my question, and mostly referring to um, the project from Zaha in Tallinn, for example, since as you know, because I shared with you the brief, the, the, one of the topics of the brief this year is the sea level rising. And beside all the economic drivers and uh, everything that you've already been talking about, uh, is there also any consideration in your projects, personal projects, and Zaha did one, in terms of environmental impact? Because the master plan in Tallinn is an arbor at the end of the day. It's right in front of the sea. And one of the things the students are dealing with is uh, a projection into 30, 50, 100 years about this problem. So you showed, for instance, the timeline of how the project is going to develop in that case. So is there also something that you are taking, you guys in Zaha are taking into consideration from the point of view of environmental impact, sea level rising, uh, if we want even global warming to be a bit more general? Um, yes and no. So um, 
uh, that in certain cases, uh, like um, in, um, so for example, in London, um, you, you've got this Thames Barrage, which is a city level intervention that keeps the level of the water uh, of the Thames inside the city in a particular level. So there's, a, there's already something there. <clears throat> um, so in a, in, a, in a small scale, such as, um, such as uh, Tallinn, you cannot interfere in urban barrages and because it's, 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 it's more of a city level decision. <clears throat> so you leave that to, for the city to do it. Um, there are many instances like um, there, there is planning in, in Amsterdam, how to keep it down, you know, if the city water level rises. Um, so at the scale of the projects that I showed in, in, of Saadi, it, it, it is not possible because it needs a bigger intervention. But the scale of this city that I finished in the end, which is uh, 152 square kilometers or even bigger, it is possible. And uh, it, would be, it would be the responsibility of, of the government to, to, to plan and uh, implement certain, certain ideas. Because, okay, buildings can't be floating high. Uh, buildings are static. I mean, there are many attempts of floating cities from like from Da Vinci to everybody, but you know, there are issues. And there are issues of floating. There are issues of mechanisms. There are issues of longevity and what we observe. So floating cities per se is, is it may be one or two exceptions, but it's not going to be the future. The future is static. Uh, static land, static, uh, and and we would probably do whatever it takes to, to protect the land when the rising of the sea level. That is what, how I see it. Um, and and to do that, you know, there are, in, as I said, barrages are one example. Other examples are, um, are trying to trying to keep uh, trying to create. Like if you look at um, what we did in uh, in Hamburg. Uh, we, we, we've created a, a, a promenade. So you create a higher promenade that protects the water coming inwards to the city. So previously there was no promenade and then the, there's a vertical wall coming up. So there are many examples of how to do it. So at an urban scale, you could think about promenades to do it. But I think um, the level of rising has a lot to do with the, the water um, if you're not close to the sea, if you're close to rivers, you can you can stop it with barrages and, and other possible interventions, which are city level interventions. So I'm not very sure, David, how how to uh, address it, other than promenades that I mentioned in Hamburg, um, how to address it in in, in a smaller yeah. development like like yeah, Thailand. I, I, I recall your, the project you are talking about in uh, in um, as well as a couple of interventions. Uh, from uh, BIG in uh, in the USA, so when there is a, a river, it's a bit easier to to contain it and uh, and promenade with high walls are generally the first the first option they go for. Guys, any question for uh, Subarti? There is a question from a student at the end of the room. It's called Enric. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> I I know that student. I think. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, so, sorry, can you hear me from this? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the first project because for the other project you described, they are mainly surrounded by some existing road networks. So there are some contacts to start with. But the first project is like half of it is just facing the water. So what is the drive of the design of that project? No, um, Henrik, there is road networks. There is, uh, I think one of the slides I showed, it showed the existing roads that are coming in, uh, which, are, uh, which are pretty much um, given what traffic is coming through. So when you have the trucks, for example, they only come in from a particular road that go towards the port or the cars, because you know these cars and all go into the ferry. So there are existing roads. I think I showed the slide where existing roads then go and meet the meet the roads of the site, which are under the ground, and then go and into the ferry. 
so there are uh, existing roads there which we have um, which we had to follow i mean it, it has to go through but within the side we can play how it goes through so that that was part of the design is is that the answer uh, pa pa he, he is not convinced by your answer okay but uh, <laughs> Clear. So if this is the site and here is the city, yeah. so understand how the city is merging into the site, but how about uh, the, the direction facing to the sea? Is there any strategy that driving the yes. city? Um, uh, well, the strategy is already there. We didn't have to interfere. The strategy was of the ferry routes. The ferry routes and the ship routes, they're already there. So we we could not we like i think one of the slides i showed that there's a new ferry terminal the position of the ferry terminal was was that it couldn't be flexible much and how people from the ferry so you 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 it, it was a ferry access so from the ferry how people move through the site uh, is is also a pedestrian not so much car so it's different mode of transport it's walking but yeah it's there and i got thank you as usual, there are a few technical, not limitations, but points that are there. And maybe you don't want them, you cannot move them, so you work with them to your adapt. Any other question? Ah, Carlos has a question. Yeah. It's a request because I think it was very interesting the process you show in the Hanjo project, because you have these diagrams. I mean, I'm asking if you can go back very fast to show the students because these diagrams, everything that is before the project, I think is so important. Uh, you, you show it really in a very complete and interesting way. So just to let them double check. Are you talking about these diagrams? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is the city diagram. Because you were showing the different scales and how you are approaching the site. So I consider this very, very interesting. Yeah, so it moves from urban scale, um, overall city scale. So even though the site is much smaller, yes. we, we do some research uh, of the city level and, and, and find it. Uh, so social, you know, cultural, environmental, economic, everything together to give a responsive idea of what is potentially successful in the site. So I think this is, um, as you say, it's, it's a good way to bring about, but uh, the result is a high density, high rise somehow. So, so um, uh, no, but I, I absolutely, I mean, the research that goes before, uh, before we come in to interfere with the site is, is quite important. Yeah. Uh, is there any other diagram you wanted me to go back to? No, this mainly this one because uh, you are showing how the site is related to the city and how it's important to have a uh, general understanding yes. about what's happening in the surroundings. Sometimes it's difficult to define which is the surrounding area of the site. Sometimes we limitate our research just to the site of what is immediately uh, there. But I think it's also important to have a, a bit of understanding of, in the bigger scale about which role yes, absolutely. Is according maybe to other developing areas or other places that are interested. Also the diagrams you were showing, I think is about the uh, um, pedestrian and the, the connectivity. Where the same project? I think so, yeah. Okay, this one's? Yeah, yeah, because we were very clear and very interesting. So, yeah, this is. Everything that is supporting the project, this was not a master plan, but actually, in this case, with the 3D modeling, you are showing uh, the yeah. connectivity and the different levels and layers that you are uh, willing to have. Yeah, so some of these diagrams are like vehicles, mobility, slow mobility. So usually my 
uh, I mean, the easiest way to split these diagrams is based on speed. Um, it doesn't matter what scale could be higher scale. It's always based on speed uh, of people movement and, uh, and how they connect together at different layers. Um, it's, 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 it gives a very clear um, indication of what the or feel of what the place would be like. Yeah. Because at the end, I think this is very related to this iconic bridge. I, I think it's coming also from the understanding of the speed of the users and how they, which kind of experience they will have during the time they are crossing that one. So, yes. Uh, so we had, uh, I think, one slide where we showed the bridge across. But yeah, absolutely. The bridge, uh, you know, it, it also defines, uh, you know, the island and, and how that you know you get opportunities of making and because as you can see the site was pretty much very occupied so that to make icons you know you have to you have to find something like that where uh, you you if you on the river you can still identify yeah thank you yes and again the concept of speed embeds the concept of time okay you know what speed is it's space and time, so you need also time, this fourth dimension when designing. Any question uh, from the from those that are remotely connected? Yes, someone unmuted herself. <laughs> I can't resist. Uh, first of all, Subhanti, thank you so much for the lecture because I think it's a fabulous overview from historic urban planning and design as well as current and future outlook but that maybe the students are not as often exposed to because the books are usually duffy and old and professors usually are duffy and old uh, so i'm very glad that you actually provided this um, david, is, um, david is young he's just had his <laughs> it's his birthday today i think exactly exactly so the students <laughs> people nice to him today but just that um, way, not old but uh, the, uh, what I really enjoyed is that you also put in the dilemma between the building regulations, the developers, the architects, those different stakeholders that actually drive a design. It is not just the architect. Um, but I have one very provocative question that I'm sure there's no right or wrong answer either. What do you think urban planning and design will change due to the pandemic? or similar events. I mean, we always had this discussion with uh, uh, terrorism and how it changes it. And of course, with the pandemic uh, nowadays, how will it change the way cities are constituted or used? It's a, it's a very good question, Gisela, because I just published an article in, in, um, in, in the Leaf Review. It, it should be out this month um, on this pandemic and city um, uh, correlation um, together with uh, you know D Douglas Farr from America and, and another person from uh, South America so three of us published this article and I think I think pandemic um, and so I we started the article by saying that things like for example the the black plague in in London gave rise because the sanitation in london wasn't very good it gave rise to a better victorian sewage system which is still today strengths of london's you know uh, london as a city the sewage system is fantastic um, similarly long ago uh, when there was another uh, episode the 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 tuberculosis they 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 came up with uh, you know, medication and, and medical systems upgraded in the city. So the city, as much as it is about the planning of buildings, it's also about the, the, the systems that may build it, you know, the, the sewage systems, the, the, the residential, uh, the, uh, so, um, so the, the medical system. So I think one of the things that the pandemic has brought or what we're seeing, uh, at least in, in, in France, we have seen um, the you know since 1980s, Jane Jacobs had been talking about making pedestrianizing streets. We have finally the mayor of Paris have has uh, has made her political agenda to have a 15-minute city. 
15 minute walking distances. So that is something that has come out of the pandemic. As soon as that was done, London has followed suit. They have come out with, they are following it. They had decided to go the 15 minute city module. So there's a big, there has been a couple of areas of change, but these cities, mind you, can do it because their inner fabric, uh, which is a mesh system, allows them to do it with smaller scale roads. And it is possible. But would it be possible to do it in Beijing? Uh, no, uh, it's not. Uh, because the city scale is different and, and, and the road systems are, it's driven by road systems. So um, I think the, it's a very good question. And it's something that we are doing currently, <laughs> Uh, I'm doing a research on is how to break down the 1960s model of cities into something that we could make a walkable one. How can we break it down with the system? So as you have seen that um, um, the last slide that I showed, I mean, I think I presented to you guys three years ago, the, the endless city module, but that time it was conceptual, but we are now getting it more tangible into a city level. But now the next next challenge for us is to is to interfere into these cities that are completely out of scale and try and make it into a scale that could adapt a 15 minute city module at some point uh, would it be possible we don't know but okay so that that's one of the biggest change the second change has been that um, in areas like uk where you know the health systems um, you know like the nhs were were I think 65 billion in debt, but the government has released funds to, to release the health system. I mean, there was talk about privatizing the health system at one point, but now they have retracted on that, the same government, and they've said that, no, we are gonna pump money into it and we are gonna maintain it because we see it's a benefit. So even though these systems are a bit slower than countries like India to come up with, with new, um, new, to adapt, take in new medication, but at the same time, they're very more stable and, and they cater to a larger mass uh, with uniformity without prejudices. So I think that has been a second benefit of the pandemic. Uh, so yeah, the cities have, uh, and, and hopefully what I wrote, the last point was that hopefully people will see that it's not the buildings that make the city, it's the amenities that build the city. Better the amenities. The, 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 the better the facilities, medical facilities, better the, the parks, local parks, not city level parks, but local parks. That is what makes healthier living. And so hopefully we will have more centers like that. Because for, for me, it's also the scale issue. You know, there was a, this trend with globalization at the same time in architecture and urban design to do large uh, event halls, to do uh, large centralized public spaces, et cetera, on it, which will most likely go more into a controlled measure and more small scale, as you said yourself, into like district level parks to serve itself. Um, here in China, what is phenomenal is that you have a control measure because you actually have barriers, these boom bars, et cetera, on it at every estate and at every uh, entry exit to the, uh, to the motorways as well, which is there. And I was initially wondering why do they have this? I mean, now it made sense because now I know what it can be used for. Um, but I'm sure there's a more intelligent way and a more designery way to integrate and to do small scale rather than large scale or centralized systems. Yes, um, there, there is. But I mean, we need to have city level parks as well. But at the same time, I think the, what has happened with the 60s model is the neighborhood levels have been forgotten. Yes. And, uh, and that is the hub. Uh, and that is why people are moving out of cities once they have the money. Well, Till they have the money, they have to live in the city. But once they have it, they move out. So you were saying that people who have made all the money in the city are then going and spending it outside the city. And that's not what the city wants economically as well. Mm -hmm. So the city, um, we have been arguing for many years that the city needs to keep its money as well as generated. Um, so so that that is a very good point. And, and hopefully uh, the Paris model and... Um, uh, you know, Carlos Modena, who's a South American uh, architect who, who proposed this for Paris. Um, he, he's, they, 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 they are seeing 
of the fruit now and and hopefully we will have um uh, a different but saying that i mean you know uh, many years ago when jane jacob was fi fighting uh this guy um, robert moses in new york and then she came up with the book uh, the death life and death of american cities she won a few cases at the time you know a couple of areas she protected uh, the east side of manhattan she protected it um, but she wasn't successful in protect protecting the rest of the U.S. The rest of the U.S. went on to do exactly what Robert Moses was asking them to do. And, and they kind of grew. And then you landed up Houston, uh, which was a dead city after a while, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, would these models of Paris and, 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 um, and London, uh, which they're adapting now, still be valid once this pandemic is over, a few, three years down the line when people have forgotten about it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> and it will be interesting to watch and looking forward to see the article. If you, if it comes out, if you can share us, uh, the link would be fabulous. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank I will. So uh, much, uh, really. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Any final question from the students on campus? Offline world. No, the <laughs> offline. How about the online world? Any question? Okay, looks like no. All right. So I would say that we can say thank you to Subhat and we can leave him to his Monday, London Monday morning. Well, thank you guys. Uh, it's great to see everyone and, and uh, it's great to see that all of you are at least in one room together. So there's hope. You look, you, 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 you look very alone in, in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are, we, we are going to, like we are going, <laughs> we are going to go back to the office, uh, but we are allowed to meet in public, but obviously the numbers are going up again. So who knows? Okay. Swati, thanks a lot. I will Thank you. of course share the recording with you uh, by the end thanks of the very much. and uh, we will stay in touch. Thanks a lot again, and thanks to all of those who got connected to this lecture. Thank you. And, and good luck to the students for your semester. Exciting project. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank bye. 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 And meeting.